Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Tam Church on this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Luke, and I have the honor and privilege to serve this congregation as pastor. A special welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream. If you are joining us in that way, I invite you to use the chat section to connect with one another. And if you have a prayer that you would like lifted up during our joys and concerns time, you can also type that into the chat and I will do my best to lift those prayers up on your behalf uh, when we reach that time. Today is a very special Sunday. We are welcoming Reverend Heather Hammer uh, as our preacher today. Many of us in the church have been uh, reading her book, Shetland Mist, and um, have found a lot of good conversation around that book and have found it to be extremely meaningful. If you haven't had a chance to uh, check out the book yet, there will be copies for sale after the service, and we invite you to check it out. And even if you want the author to sign one, I think she's willing to do that for you. So uh, please stay for fellowship time, connect with one another, check out the book. Pastor Heather is somebody who is very special to me. She's not only a colleague, but she is a friend and a mentor of mine uh, when I first started out in the ordination process. Heather was there. She uh, was um, uh, my predecessor in one of my roles at a previous congregation, and she was on our board of ordained ministry and an amazing support to both me and many other of my clergy colleagues. So thank you for being with us today, Heather. We're so glad to have you. Um, in your bulletin, you will find out about all of the things happening in the life of our church, so I invite you to take a copy home with you and calendar anything that may be of interest to you. Also, um, if you are newer to our community, we have blue cards in the back of each pew. If you fill one of those cards out, especially with your email, that will get you on our Faith Matters weekly electronic newsletter that has the most up-to-date happenings in the life of our church. And one thing that I do not think is listed in the bulletin, but I want to make sure to lift up to your attention, is next week after worship, we will be moving out to our new labyrinth where we'll have a special time of dedication and prayer for the labyrinth. And um, a part of that will be explaining the, a brief history of the labyrinth and um, how we can utilize it as a spiritual tool for our lives. And so if you um, have a little bit extra time after worship next week, please um, mark that off to be able to stay here and be with us for that occasion. Tricia, do you have an announcement? Good morning. I wanted to extend an invitation. Uh, for next Friday, we have a campfire night. It is open to all ages, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. I haven't quite decided where the best place for our fire pit will be, but it might be either in the parking lot or the concrete courtyard over there. We are going to have uh, campfire stories, songs with uh, Lynn and Alan on guitar and banjo, and s'mores. So 6.30 to 8 o'clock on Friday. Please join us. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to move us from announcements into our formal worship by inviting you to stand as you are able for our call to worship. When the tides of fear seem to overwhelm us, we cry out, Lord, come to us and lead us to paths of safety. When we feel lost and alone and we wonder if anyone cares about us, we cry out. Lord, come and heal our wounded spirits. When turbulence within and without seem to threaten us, we cry out, Lord, bring us peace. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you're able for our opening hymn. It's number 467, Trust and Obey.
open your bulletin to the first page, you'll find our opening prayer. And these words are in bold, which invites us to pray this together. Let us pray. When we feel overwhelmed by the storms of life, enter our hearts with your redeeming love, O Lord. When our fears overtake us and we cannot find our way, give us direction that we might faithfully serve you all of our days. May we be a people of hope who boldly sing your praises. Amen. At this time, I invite our children, our young people, our youth, whoever is young at heart to come forward for our young person's moment as we sing This Is Where Children Belong. so much for helping with that food. A reminder to the congregation that each and every Sunday we pick up food for the Marin or collect food for the Marin County Food Bank. So if you have something that you'd like to donate, you can bring it to church with you, put it in the center aisle, and then our young folks will pick it up during this time. So I want to tell you guys about an ancient time. An ancient time before we had things like cell phones and an ancient time before we had Alexa, and I'm saying it quietly in case anybody online, I don't want to set off their device at home, but where Alexa would give us reminders of things. And some people would carry around a calendar, a big physical calendar with all of their appointments and reminders. But when I was a kid, I didn't have a big calendar or book of reminders like that. And then if I did, I probably would have forgot it somewhere. So my grandmother taught me a lesson about remembering things when she was young. And you may have heard or seen this lesson before, but it was tying a string around your finger. If there was something really important you wanted to remember, you'd tie a string around your finger. And that was really helpful for me. And then I just started thinking about the thing, if I couldn't just have a bunch of strings on my fingers, maybe I could look for things in the world, things that happen regularly, that then could remind me of something important. And this week or two, Stephanie, you can back me up on this, in our house, a particular song, which I've attached as a memory to remind me of something, has been sung and played over and over and over again. And it's a song that I'm guessing almost everybody, if not everybody in this congregation has heard before, has sung before, maybe many times. I know I have probably sang this song over a hundred times in my life. I'm going to just start it. And if anybody else seems to know what I'm singing and knows the words, you can sing along with me. Here's the song I'm talking about. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Up came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. Oh my gosh, you did know it. And I think a lot of people around here knew it too. And you know, so I'm thinking, I'm doing some quick math in my head. If each one of us has sang that song a hundred times in our life, that means there's like over 10,000 times just in this room that song has been around. And so now, can I tell you what that song reminds me of? It reminds me of how important it is to keep climbing even when you get knocked down, even when life is hard. Because think about it. That, it's a simple song, but that's what it's about. It's about a spider going up, getting washed down, but then not stopping, not giving up. That spider climbs up again, and we keep singing it over and over again. Your parents sang that song. I bet some of your grandparents sang that song and even great-grandparents sang that song. It is a song that for the rest of your life you will keep coming across. And every time you hear that song, 
I invite you to remember what I remember. And what that is, is that even though sometimes things are hard, God is always with us to help us keep climbing. Our friends and family at church are with us to help us keep climbing. And that life is not always easy. Sometimes friends disappoint us. Sometimes we try really hard at something and we don't get the results we were hoping for. But each time you hear the itsy bitsy spider, I hope you remember that in both your success and your failures, those hard times, God is still with you. Your church is still with you. And tomorrow is always another day to climb up again. I'm going to pray. And if everybody or anybody would like to repeat after me, you're welcome to do so. Let us pray. Dear God, God, thank you for the reminder reminder of your love and your support support. when we hear songs songs. like the itsy bitsy spider. spider. Help us to be brave. Help us to trust. trust. Help us to keep climbing. climbing. Amen. And now the choir is going to sing a song for us. So if you just want to scoop back and put your back against the pew, you can have front row seats for this song. To everything, a season. To everything, a time. A moment to move forward and leave the past behind. As summer turns to autumn and bids farewell to spring, there comes a time for turning to every living thing. The breezes change direction. The geese turn homeward bound. The leaf turns from its clinging and falls upon the ground. The flower turns from blooming to slumber in the snow. And so, to all a season, a time for letting go. Now is the time for turning, and this the place to start for yielding to the yearning for changing of the heart. A moment to surrender the things we should release, should release. Forgive and find forgiveness, and in forgiveness, peace, and in forgiveness, peace. Thank you.
please join me in the prayer, the prayer before the reading. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear what you say to us today. Amen. Today's scripture selection comes to us from Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 through 27, and Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. I looked at the earth, and it was without shape or form, at the heavens, and there was no light. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were rocking back and forth. I looked, and there was no one left. Every bird in the sky had taken flight. I looked, and the fertile land was a desert. All its towns were in ruins before the Lord, before his fury. The Lord proclaims, the whole earth will become a desolation, but I will not destroy it completely. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, we read, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach other to say, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. May we find renewed meaning in this sacred scripture. Amen. It's wonderful to be here today, and thank you for the warm welcome. The last time I was in this church with my husband Jim was for Henry Yeats Memorial Service. Henry was my husband's aunt, and some of you remember her. Uh, my husband Jim Henry Hammer is named for his aunt, and he always thought he had a girl's name for a middle name, a, but indeed it was Henry. It's good to be here again. Let, let us pray together. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. At home where I sit and do most of my writing on my laptop, I look out at the distant hills and grapevines, and behind me on the wall, I sit on a sofa. You know, when you have a laptop, you can be very comfortable and Choose your favorite place to do your work. So behind me on the wall in the living room is a picture of a man looking rather glum. And he's portrayed on the front of your bulletin. It's the painting of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is such a strange person to want to have on your wall, especially with such sadness. But The painting, which of course is a print of a famous painting, was on the wall of my dad's office. He was a professor at Pacific School of Religion in the field of psychology and religion. And when he retired, he took down that painting and I asked him, why did you want that on the wall anyway? It seems kind of depressing. Um, But he said, well, if the great prophet Jeremiah can carry the woes of the world and yet live on each day with hope, then that gives me an inspiration to keep working and to keep living my life. 
And so I wanted to keep that painting, and, and it is with me all the time in our living room. The prophet Jeremiah was burdened with many woes. This is a painting by Michelangelo of the 16th century, and you might have seen it on the Sistine Chapel in Rome at the Vatican City. Sometimes Jeremiah was called the prophet of doom. His writing laments the fall of Jerusalem and the sinfulness of all of humankind. Our first reading today tells of the desolation Mountains trembling, no stars in the sky, no birds could be seen or heard. The gardens and the orchards are shriveled up as if it is winter. In fact, it was the winter of life. A place that can seem very wintry, even in the summer, is the Shetland Islands. North of Scotland, part of Scotland, but very far north, not far from the Arctic Circle. And Luke has invited me to share with you something of my book called Shetland Mist, which takes place there in this very remote island community. I've written a book about the everyday life of my great-great-grandmother, whose name was Anne Leslie. And she had nine children, and she raised them on this windswept island. Some of you have read this book, I know, in two book groups. Who's read the book? Okay, or who has a book and is wanting to read it or planning to read it? Okay, great. So the subtitle is A Shetland Family in the Methodist Movement. And there are many tragic losses in the story. Some people have told me they needed Kleenex nearby. It's about personal hardship, but also social hardship of the time and place. Historical fiction is always about time and place. And so both of these factors play important parts in the story. The story is true to a point. It's true according to the birth and death dates of Anne and Robert, her husband, and the nine children, and the causes of their deaths, I know, because my dad and his father wrote it down on the family tree in notes beside each person's name. Well, it's fiction because I made up the rest of it. I don't know all the facts. I know some history of what happened in Shetland during those years of 19, or sorry, 1829 to 1873. That's the span of the time of the story. But I don't know everything. So of course the dialogue and the prayer life and the theology is all my writing. Well, why did I write this book? In 1961, my family of origin went to Shetland. We went overnight on a ferry from Aberdeen, which is in the very far north coast of Scotland. And we went to visit our cousins, my third cousins, my dad's second cousins. And we saw the very two-room stone croft house where my great-great-grandparents had lived with their nine children. It's still standing, and I saw it in 1961, and I heard the story of my family members who had lived there and all of their tragedies. You know, the father's lost at sea, and the, the children have diseases. Some die, some they nearly starve to death from poverty. Life is so hard, and as an 11-year-old at the time, the story made a great impression on me. I just thought, oh my goodness, I'm so privileged. And my family, ancestors, had it so hard. Well, I grew up in Berkeley, and then later became a teacher and minister. And when I retired from full-time ministry in 2017, I began researching both my family tree and the history of the Methodist movement in the 19th century. And I realized there was an intersection of the two stories. My husband and I went to Shetland in 2018. And we had a wonderful time there. We visited with five of my third cousins who are still there, descendants of the one daughter who stayed in Shetland. And again, we saw the actual Croft House where this family had lived. It's in the back of the property of one of my third cousins, Alice, and it's two rooms, 
a butt head and a bend end, and the area around it would have been sheep farming. So while we were there, we, we heard lots of fiddle music, wonderful music. I went to the library and researched in the archives and to the museum and to the Shetland Family History Society to learn about my family and to the Methodist Church, which is the Adam Clark Memorial Methodist Church in Lerwick, the main town of the island called Mainland in Shetland. And the people were wonderful at the church. They invited us to cake at tea time and we went and everybody brought cake and it was really a very warm, welcoming place. There are 13 Methodist churches in the Shetland Islands, which is quite amazing, given that there are only 23,000 people there. You know, your town is a lot bigger than that. And the land area of the Shetland Isles is only the size of London. It's just like a city. It's kind of a skinny island with little outer islands that you can go to by ferry. And there were 13 Methodist churches which are practicing their faith today. Sometimes they have rotating ministers. Not all of the churches are open every week, but uh, the one in Lerwick is. And so we went there twice, and what a treat that was. Well, in the 1800s, the Methodist missionaries had come by sailing boats to the poor crofters. They came all the way from England, where Methodism was strong after John Wesley the century before. And they brought to the crofter people, people trying to make a living off of these little bits of land, they brought them grain. And they built what is called meal roads. They brought that grain by pony-drawn cart on the little lanes where the ponies had trekked along the island. They brought grain to the people who were starving, and they brought the gospel with Bibles and the organization of small groups and class meetings, and they built chapels out of the stones that were already there on the island. This is how my family became Methodist. The missionaries brought both grain and the gospel, and trudging along through the bogs, over the heath, those missionaries brought hope. And in America, two generations later, my grandfather and my great uncle became Methodist ministers, and then my father and I. It's a history I'm proud of and so happy to know a bit about. My great-great-grandmother faced each tragedy somehow managing to go on. I believe it was because of the Christian community around her, the neighbors helping each other, pitching in, taking care of one another through all of the hardship that they faced. They attended chapel, they sang hymns, and the fellowship buoyed their spirits. Even though they faced near starvation and disaster, disease, they continued to believe in something beyond themselves. They believed in God and that made a difference in their daily lives. The story of faith itself, the story of the darkness of Good Friday that turns to the light of Easter morning is our story. It is the story that hope continues through it all. The hope of the good news of Jesus Christ is what we can all hold on to. We have it. Like the seasons, winter does not last forever. Soon the bulbs push their green stems up through that cold earth. When we were in Shetland, the daffodils were everywhere. It was in late April. And those daffodils were just everywhere, pushing themselves up to bring that color back after the winter time. It was still windy and cold. And we would always say, don't open the door until you get your whole coat on and your scarf and your hat and your mittens because whoosh, when you open that door, it was windy, so forceful. And dark and light play quite a role in life in Shetland. In the 1800s, they didn't have electricity, so the families gathered around the dim light of a fish oil lantern. And in the far north of Shetland, then and now, there are only five hours of daylight in winter. When we were there, we watched the season of lambing, 
one of our third cousin's daughter is running the croft now near the mill in Quendal. And lambing was happening. We actually watched the lambs come out of the ewes and be held up. Oh, what a sign of the change of seasons, like the choir sang today about the turning, the turning from despair to hope. The people of Shetland in the 19th century needed good news. They needed to hear the gospel story. Their lives were very hard. Crofters, who were farmers mainly and then also fishermen, were beholden to the lairds. The lairds are the landowners, wealthy Scots who owned the land, and the Shetland people were tenants on that land, beholden to give the laird their crops of oats and barley, milk, cheese, and knitwear. The men were gone at sea so much of the time, overnight, fishing. So the women were left to run the croft and homeschool the children and knit in every free moment. We even have a picture from the museum of women carrying in the kishi on the back, the basket of peat, carrying the peat to the croft, and they are knitting with their hands as they walked. It's kind of amazing. Every second they had to use to make income. So they were knitting sweaters that were then sold onto the ships at the harbor in Lerwick. Jeremiah writes a lot about darkness and gloom. But did you hear in the second reading? There was a change. He said, the time is coming when God will make a brand new covenant. This new covenant will be written on the people's hearts. God will be our God and we will be God's people. God says in the message version, I will wipe the slate clean for each person. This is the hope that we have, even in times of despair. The prophet is first downcast and disappointed in humanity, but later the prophet says, God gives us another chance. The end of the story is not the destruction of Jerusalem, and it's not the exile into Babylon. It is the hope of return. Like Jeremiah, Jesus was both a critic of society and the bearer of hope. They are my two favorites, Jeremiah and Jesus. <laughs> there, are, there are something else. Um, Jesus always wanted a renewed relationship between people. Always wanted a new day. In Jesus' death and resurrection, we see that death is not the end of the story. For on the third day, the tomb is empty and Christ is risen. And there is hope again. Hope is alive. The theme of Shetland Mist, the book, is that even in hardship and loss, we can still find courage. How? Because we have faith in God. And then we discover that we can be resilient. We can go on. The title Shetland Mist gives the idea, I hope, that even in this remote and cold and rainy place, in this historical time of struggle and hardship, and darkness, there is still a glimpse of light coming through the mist, just a little bit coming through. The future is not completely opaque or winter bleak. There's always a new season and more light. You can see through the mist, you know, we, we had fog today. I wouldn't have called it mist exactly, but mist is very common in Scotland. Sometimes you can only see a little through that mist. Near the end of the book, the story says, Anne concluded the future could not be seen just as in a thick Shetland mist. So why trouble herself? Only hope. That was the message. Well, why can we trust that there is always hope? Simply because we never walk alone, and we know that. God has written the law of love on our hearts right here. We carry it with us. We need only turn to God when we feel alone or afraid or downcast. Here in this community, you can lean on one another each day. You can share your common faith 
and hope knowing that there will always be a new day. You surely have had some rough times. I know you have. Most of us have experienced a death in the family. If you are young, maybe you had a pet that died or a grandparent. Middle-aged people probably know of a friend who died early from cancer or heart disease. And seniors among us have lost spouses, parents, even children. The losses are real. What helps us go on? You know, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I don't know what I would have done without my church. I've heard that so many times. I know when I've had a death in the family, the first call I've made is to the church. And then I'm reminded I'm not alone. Many of us have not suffered from the poverty that our ancestors may have experienced. It's important that we put ourselves in relationship with those who have less, that we might care more deeply what it's like, think about it, to come to this country as a refugee without family or friends or job skills or money. It's important that we support efforts to change the structures of our society that foster racism and prejudice against people who are different from us. And it's important to be intentional allies and walk with people who have been discriminated against. We need to be intentional about exposing ourselves to social hardship through reading, making new relationships, supporting causes that advocate for others. Like I know you had Katherine Parker here speaking, and she's part of your congregational family. She came to my church in Livermore, too. She's the missionary in Nepal, whom we support. What a wonderful ministry she is a part of. I think Jeremiah was downcast because he felt others suffering so deeply. He took it on himself. He was weighed down. He said, my joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark, the cry of the poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion, he asked. He felt despair to the point of questioning the very existence of God. Where are you, God, anyway? The harvest is past, he said. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? What thinking believer does not at some time question God? Why, oh God, is there such suffering? Perhaps the early Methodist missionaries that sailed from England to Shetland had asked these questions. Why are the Shetlanders suffering so? And rather than doing nothing, they created a mission. They went with Bibles and with hope and with grain for the people who were so hungry there. And they developed small groups and they built chapels. They taught the people of Shetland the system that John Wesley had developed in England, the founder of the Methodist movement with small groups and chapels. And gradually through the 1800s, they advocated for an end to the trucking system that favored the rich and victimized the poor. And there was a crofter's law that then changed all that at the end of the century. This is the Wesleyan practice. And I've tried to illustrate the Wesleyan theology and the character of Anne when she cries out to God, why is life so unfair? How can I go on anyway? And yet her prayers always end with a doxology. You are God. It is you to whom I look for strength. We do not have plenty, but we have enough. Thanks be to God. It's enough to believe in God and have trust in the community of faith that supports each member through all of life's hardships and struggles. That is enough. The great Protestant composer, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a cantata with the title, Ich habe genug. It means, I have enough. It's based on the story of Simeon 
in the Bible who at his very old age goes to the temple and gets to hold the infant Jesus. This event fills him with such gratitude and hope and joy that he accepts his own nearing death. The text translated from English, from German into English is, even if I were to take my leave in death, I would be able to say, I have enough. Like Jeremiah, like Jesus, we need to accept the reality of suffering in our lives and in our world. Face it, have compassion for it, respond in caring ways as we can, and then trust our faith that it will carry us through. God is with us. We have enough. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Heather. We are invited to respond to that message in song. You may remain seated, but let us join together in the CARES Chorus, which is number 2215 in the faith we sing, and we will sing it through twice. about and reflect on those early Methodist missionaries that Pastor Heather was sharing about, folks who took the time, took the effort, took the resources to provide hope for the people in the Shetland Islands. So too do we get to carry on that legacy. One of the ways we carry on the legacy of sharing and helping those in our community and instilling hope in our world is through the sharing of our gifts and worship. As we share what we have, may we remember these words from Jesus. Where we place our treasure, so too will be our heart. Please stand as you are able for the doxology. Praise the Spirit. 
God, we give thanks for all of the gifts in our life. In response to all that we have, we offer back this portion for the work of your church, praying that these gifts may be used according to your holy and perfect will as we strive to be a people of hope who share hope with others. Amen. You may be seated. One of the ancient practices of the Christian church when we gather together for worship is to share the prayers of our heart, to share the joys and concerns that we bring into worship with us, acknowledging that we have one another. We have one another to celebrate with the joys of life, and we have one another to pray and support and journey as we encounter personal struggles as well as witness to struggles that are big and beyond our community happening in the world. I want to begin by sharing a couple that are online. Jan O'Brien lifts up prayers for the people of Libya after the floods, and we think about the other folks around the world that we have heard affected by natural disasters such as flooding and storms and earthquakes. We also pray for those who are responding in those areas, bringing hope, bringing support, letting those affected know they are not alone. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Jane Hall lifts up prayers and greetings. Um, she is in Palo Alto helping uh, with a new family member, Camille Grace Hall, who was born on September 7th. So celebrating a growing family in Jane Hall's family. New life, we give thanks. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. My son Caleb made sure to adamantly remind me about 13 times, including four times right before the service starts, that uh, during joys and concerns time, I need to make sure to lift up the joy that his aunt and uncle are with us from Ohio visiting my brother Matthew Ham and my sister-in-law Mason Ham. And so we've had a wonderful weekend together and, and they're heading home or actually they're heading to visit my cousin first up north and then heading home, but uh, prayers of gratitude for having them with us as well as prayers for safety as you journey forward and then eventually journey back home. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. What prayers do you bring with you today? What is on your heart to share? Yes, John. For Lorraine and Phil, small business owners who, um, like many other small businesses, are in a, um, always having to give 150% to their work. We know what um, an important task it is to run your own business, and we pray for them and others who are in seasons where they need more hope, they need more strength, and they need discernment as they care for their businesses and support the community through their businesses. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Others. Yes. We give thanks that Pastor Heather is here, especially those of us with burning questions after reading the book, which she can give some answers to. Your second prayer? Prayers for those who knew and loved Charlie, who are mourning his loss and who are at this time um, seeking the places of hope as they mourn, and but also give thanks for Charlie's life. And your third prayer? For preservation of vision for Alice. And we lift up prayers for Alice, for her vision, for preservation of her vision. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. Prayers for uh, their courage, their energy, and 
We lift up prayers for your mother, Tricia, who is in one of those seasons of waiting and learning more and planning when it comes to her health and the care of her heart. And we also pray for those high school seniors who are applying to colleges, who are thinking about their next steps, um, who are thinking about jobs, who are maybe thinking about military, all of the different um, places to journey from high school. And God, we pray that they might have their minds and hearts open to um, your presence as part of that discernment, as part of that decision-making and application-making. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, ma'am. And what was his first name? We give thanks for Bruce. We give thanks for his life and his legacy, which has been carried on even past his death. We give thanks for the lessons that he taught. And we give thanks for the grace that he showed. And God, we give thanks for your grace, which filled in any of the parts of him that may have fallen short. We celebrate life. We celebrate our legacy. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Prayers for the Corson family who has been through many, many struggles when it comes to unexpected loss of life, and they are confronted with yet another difficult to comprehend tragedy losing the life of 19 year old after football practice from a heart issue. God, we struggle to find words when we encounter such, such tragedy, especially when it comes in such a young life to a family that has already gone through so much. When our words fall short, God, may your presence and may our presence with those who are mourning, may it be enough. May we trust in the promises that Life on earth is not an end to our life, and that at the end of time, we will all be reunited again. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. We lift up prayers for those who are affected by the fentanyl crisis and the opiate crisis. And we think of not only of those who have physically directly been impacted by that, but by their families and support structures who have been struggling to figure out the best way to support their loved one while dealing with such, such addictive substances and such um, powerful substances which can take life away in an instant. We pray, God, for those first responders who are equipped with the proper tools to be able to alleviate overdoses, and we pray that our society might find holistic ways, holistic approaches to caring for these folks and to caring for um, our young people to educate them on the dangers of such things. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Melissa. We lift up your dad in prayer who is back in the hospital with heart issues. We pray for his care team. We pray for his support system, his family. We pray for you, Melissa, as you were visiting him and 
he was released and now back to hear that he's back in the hospital and the roller coaster of emotions that come with that news and being so physically distant from that situation. God, may you be at work through the medical providers as well as your miraculous healing spirit. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Louise. Tuesday is the day for heart replacement. Not hip. I've been talking a lot about heart replacement. Yeah. Hip. Hip. Even I know that. No, I'm just kidding. Hip. I don't know where my words are. It's okay. For prayer for caregivers of all kinds, local, in Pastor Luke, in Louise, in the Redwoods, in this congregation, and the skilled professionals, the medical people, who have assured us that they'll do everything they can, and for the hope that we have in each other and in God. It's beautifully said. We... Lift up Pastor George and all of those who support him as he prepares for surgery on Tuesday for hip surgery. And we pray that all of the hoped outcomes are fully achieved and realized. And God, just guide the hands of his doctors. May they use all of their skills and training and wisdom for a very successful procedure. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. All right, at this moment, I invite you to take just one more minute to lift up any prayers you have to God silently. Holy God, on this day, we remember we remember the past generations of Christians and Methodist missionaries caring for those in need of hope. We remember those who showed great resiliency in their lives, working multiple jobs, working without rest except for the Sabbath day. And even then, sometimes there had to be work to be done. We give thanks for their tenacity, for the way that they embraced the, the things necessary in order to live, in order to provide for their children, in order to build community. We give thanks for the modern, the present messengers of hope, those who not only share the tangible gifts of life, but who also share the spiritual gifts of a life knowing you. God, as we gather here, we've heard prayers of joy, we've heard prayers of remembrance, and we've heard prayers of sorrow. We've heard prayers of hope for healing. We've heard prayers of hope for knowing what the next steps are, what the diagnosis is. And all of it, may we recognize you are with us. And all of it, may we recognize that one of our greatest gifts that we have received from you is the church community, is our brothers, sisters, our siblings in Christ. For we are reminded over and over in the scriptures that we are one body, we are connected. And no single part of the body is less valuable than the others. We all matter. We all have a role to play. For the prayers that go beyond the simple work of our hands, for those grand hardships in life, we pray for your spirit to be at work in miraculous ways. But for those prayers which can be answered through the work of our hands in our presence, may we be bold enough, God, through your equipping spirit to put ourselves out there, to be in partnership with you, to bring answers to some of these prayers as well. For all the ways my words have fallen short, for all the prayers we 
dare not speak aloud, we turn those over to you as well, trusting that you know exactly what we need. You know exactly what is on our hearts. As we join together in the prayer your Son taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In recognition that we are not alone, in recognition that each and every person here is a reflection of our Creator, we're invited to greet one another, to look one another in the eye and extend a sign of peace. It is cold and flu season, so I'm going to invite you, rather than shaking hands, to maybe do a simple bow or a wave or what I like to call a holy fist bump, but let us greet one another in peace. I'm going to invite you to start heading back to your pews, but you can remain standing. Head back to your pews, but remain standing. We have lots of time to continue connecting at fellowship time. Um, So at this point, I'm going to invite us to close with our last song. It's in the faith we sing, number 2158, Just a Closer closer Walk with Thee.
forth from this place, I offer this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you and our world peace. Go with peace and hope in your hearts. Amen.